Welcome back to this first video about capacitive liquid level sensors. Enjoy! If we are talking about capacitive liquid level measurements, we are of course talking about a capacitor or a capacity that is changing with the liquid level. Just to give you an idea about the order of magnitude, we will be working with capacity wise. Here I have a 12,000 microfarad uh, electrolytic filter capacitor. Uh, yeah, that's not it. It's more like that. A 47 picofarad capacitor. Yeah, that's the order of magnitude uh, we'll have to work with. Here I have such a capacitor. Uh, yeah, basically <laughs> these two test leads. This is my capacitor and it currently measures here at 2 nanofarad, so 20 picofarad. So basically, uh, yeah, a capacitor is just two conductors that are electrically isolated by a dielectricum uh, from each other. And the capacity is of such a capacitor is influenced by many factors. Uh, one factor is uh, distance yeah, between the conductors and the geometry. If I just here align them very close to Together. You can already see it. Yeah, three. Can we get four? Can I get four? No, I cannot get four. I swear. I, yeah, 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 I got now. We have a 40 picofarad capacity. So obviously having your two conductors close together increases the capacity. But also the kind of isolation or dielectric substance you have between your two conductors isolating them influences the capacity. Now I replace the uh, silicon and the air in the gap between my two test leads at least for a portion here of my test leads with water. And you can see right away now we are at six 0.06 nanofarads, that is 60 picofarads. After that little teaser, just to string you along and also myself, it's 32 degrees Celsius here, quite humid, so uh, <clears throat> I might get inconsistent. Uh, we dive right into the theory. And um, that's unusual for me. We have a little look at the Wikipedia page on capacitance. Further down, we find this little formula here. And maybe you know that formula from electronics textbooks. That's the formula for the capacity of a plate co uh, capacitor. So just two conductive plates isolated by a dielectric material. And the capacity of such a plate capacitor is epsilon times A, that's the area of the plates, over D, that's the distance between the plates. And epsilon is epsilon zero times epsilon R, or relative. With epsilon zero being the electric constant, and epsilon r being the relative permittivity or also known as dielectric constant. I learned it as dielectric constant so I will use probably dielectric constant throughout the video. Anyway, uh, let's dive a little bit further into that epsilon equals epsilon zero times epsilon r part. Epsilon zero is our electric constant. Uh, you find it in other formulas, for example, in the Maxwell equation and the Coulomb equation. It's also known as the vacuum permittivity, okay? And its value is 8.854 and then lots more digits, 10 to the power of minus 12 farad over meters or farad per meter, sometimes written at uh, as farad times meters to the power of minus one. 
epsilon r or relative is the relative permittivity or also known or as I learned it the dielectric constant of a certain material and by definition for vacuum it's one and please note epsilon r doesn't have any dimension so yeah if epsilon zero is the the permittivity of vacuum then the relative permittivity to vacuum in relation to the vacuum permittivity is of course one. So epsilon r is just a measurement of the permittivity of a certain material relative to vacuum. And I have here some uh, values uh, for that epsilon r. So for air it's 1.000 five eight nine so quite close to vacuum for paper it's uh, about ish yeah depends on the paper 1.4 for silicon yeah like the uh, silicon uh, isolation here uh, i have on my test leads which we used as a capacitor in the intro uh, it's between 2.9 and 4.0 depends on the exact type of the silicon for water at 20 degrees C, it's 80. Yeah, that's enormous. For a uh, diesel fuel, it's only uh, about 2.1. And for salt water, it's only 32. Uh, please note that's not distilled water, it's lower for distilled water, that's just normal water out of the tap. Finally, I should mention that the relative permittivity for some materials might change with their temperature, yeah, for example here water, as well as the frequency of the AC you are applying to the uh, dielectric isolator. Now, so far that was electronics textbook stuff but now we come into the area of physics textbooks and there's a little text here saying okay that's the capacity of a plate capacitor but there's also this sentence here if d is sufficiently small with respect to the smallest chord of a there holds to a high level of accuracy Okay, meaning that's not exactly the capacity of a plate capacitor. It's a good approximation of the capacity of a plate capacitor. If D is, so the distance between the plates is sufficiently small. Hmm. The question is why our textbook formula from electronic textbooks is just an approximation of a plate capacitor's capacity. So again, we have our capacity given in farad and that's equal to our epsilon given in farad over meter times our area in square meters over the distance between our plates in meters. Uh, by the way, uh, meter squared divided by meters is of course meters and if we divide uh, the remaining meters here by that meters here from our epsilon, we are just left with the farads coming out here of the epsilon uh, giving us the capacity in farads. Okay, so electronic textbook picture. Yeah, there are normally two leads here, but uh, I got rid of them. Uh, we just look at the area of the two plates and uh, if they are charged, and uh, it doesn't matter which one is plus and minus in that case, positively or negatively charged, we have these nice parallel electric field lines between the two plates. And these field lines have a length of D, okay? And of course uh, the whole thing here between the plates is filled with our dielectric isolator which has a certain epsilon. But that's not the whole story. 
Our two plates not only hold a charge here at the inside where the nice parallel field lines are, they are charged everywhere. And so we have field lines also here at the edges bulging out a little bit and field lines connecting the outside areas of our two plates with each other. And again, look at that formula. The capacity is proportional to one over D. And if we interpret D, not just as the distance between the plate, but at the length of the field lines, if D is sufficiently small, the field lines here between the plates are very small. And so one over D, they contribute, yeah, a whole lot to the capacity of our plate capacitor, while these outer very long field lines, one over D, contribute only very little to the total capacity of our plate capacitor. And that's the point I want you to uh, take away from this picture, that each field line contributes to the total capacity of a capacitor, depending on how long it is. The shorter the field line, the more it contributes to the total capacity. The longer the field line is, the less it contributes to the total capacity of our capacitor. If you want to have an exact formula for even something simple as a plate capacitor, you would have to solve a Laplace equation. And uh, I, I won't go into that. Uh, that's too much for me, uh, to be honest. Uh, maybe a, you can look up a math channel where they are solving Laplace equations. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we have here in the Wikipedia entry some more formulas. We already had a look at the uh, yeah, approximation for a parallel plate capacitor. Uh, then we have here a formula for concentric cylinders. Uh, who needs that? Well, uh, basically, that's your coax cable, your typical coax cable. You have your shield outside and you have your conductor inside with some isolation and that is has normally a certain capacity per meter which you can calculate with that formula. Uh, we have eccentric cylinders but we also have, that's also interesting, a pair of parallel wires. You remember our experiment with the two parallel test leads? Yeah, that's the formula for that. However, that last formula didn't really describe our capacitor consisting of just two parallel test leads from the beginning because there are your two conductors inside the test leads and of course there is an electric field between these two conductors and these conductors have a silicon isolation with a certain epsilon r of yeah between three and four but then we had an air gap and everything around it is also air with another epsilon r that of air that was a uh, one point so our field lines uh, do not cross through a uniform medium, a dielectricum with a certain epsilon r, but they are crossing through a different dielectric isolators, silicon and air. And please yeah, take note again that the capacitor, if we go back to our initial yeah, textbook formula for the plate capacitor, is proportional to epsilon. So yeah, good luck solving that Laplace equation. But again, for the purposes of this video, it's not necessary that we have really a mathematical quantitative understanding of the capacity of some system. It's enough if we have a qualitative understanding. Yeah, just knowing it depends on the length of the field lines, that is one over D, 
and it depends on how these field lines cross through maybe different dielectric isolating materials with a certain epsilon. But enough with the theory. Let's build an actually plate capacitor here. I have here two thin aluminum plates and a uh, one sheet of paper as isolator. Done. So let's measure the capacity of our plate capacitor. Uh, yeah, we have already uh, 20 picofarads. That's just, you know that from the intro, the capacity of my test leads. And my capacitor itself has about -ish. Whoa! 1.25 nanofarads or 1250 picofarads. Huh? We're making progress building capacitors, don't we? Now I'm using two sheets of paper as isolator. We will see how that works out. Let's measure that thing. We doubled D, the distance between the plates, by adding a second sheet of paper. And now we are half about -ish. Yeah, that's not very uh, an exact experiment, but about -ish. half the capacity. It went down to now 770 picofarads. That's all nice and good so far, but what we really wanted was a, a capacitor or a capacitance for measuring a liquid level. So yeah, I have to step up my game a little bit. I have here now two thin aluminum plates uh, in a, that's a heat shrink tubing, okay, a very large heat shrink tubing. And I will just assemble them as a plate capacitor. There you go. In air, my little plate capacitor here has a capacity of about 120 picofarad. And now let's fill that up to, uh, yeah, uh, this is not exact measurement, the 600 milliliter line here and see what happens. Oh, oh, the capacity is increasing to quite a degree. So 180 picofarads. What just happened there? We have our two plates here uh, wrapped in some heat shrink material as isolator pressed together. And I don't know exactly what kind of material that heat shrink tubing is made from, but it has probably an uh, epsilon r between two and nine. Depends on the material that is actually used. And of course, as we learned, plate uh, capacitor, the majority of the capacitance is generated by the short field lines here between the plates going through our heat shrink material, mostly. I mean, there might have been some air bubbles and also some little water ingress between our two plates here. However, we have these other very long field lines uh, that go all around and uh, they are very long so they only contribute very little to the total capacity but we also changed the e the epsilon r of our outside environment here from air which is yeah approximately 1 1.005 and then something to water which is 80 okay so a factor of 80 and we saw an increase of about 50 percent of capacity 
So we went from 120 picofarads to 180 picofarads, a plus of 60 picofarads, so 50%. But maybe we can improve on that. What if we leave a cavity open between the two plates that can also fill up with water? Let's try that. I will use two wooden blocks here, uh, one at the top and one at the bottom, to create a gap. I hope that works out. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's not a perfect gap, but... <sighs> oh yeah, it is a gap. This time in air, we start with a very low capacity of just a 40 picofarad, and that's mostly my test leads. So, yeah. One picofarad added here if I connect to my plate capacitor, actually. And now let's fill up the whole thing with water again. So I filled again until the uh, 600 milliliter line and we went from 40 picofarads up to 140 picofarads. Just to put that into context, yeah, our first uh, experiment with the plates pressed together got us from dry 120 picofarads to wet 180 picofarads. That's an increase of 50%. A nice signal, but <laughs> with the gap between the plates that can fill up with water, we went from 40 picofarads dry to wet 100 picofarads. That's an increase of 250%. That's a much bigger signal. In fact, it's a five times bigger signal. However, Having that cavity inside your sensor that can fill up depending on its size uh, and depending on <clears throat> your liquid, yeah, uh, think wastewater for example, uh, it might fill up with gunk and uh, yeah, trash your sensor readings over time and uh, depending on its size, it might be hard to clean. So uh, let's try the next variant. Now, we can increase the distance between our plates, so the parallel field lines that go through, uh, yeah, not water or not air, will not contribute so much to the capacity by adding just, uh, yeah, for example, some piece of styrofoam. And let me assemble the whole thing. Okay, not perfect, but good enough for a test. It's not perfect, I told you that our initial capacity is 30 picofarads. Uh, that's basically the capacity generated by our test leads. So with that large distance here between our plates, uh, our <coughs> plate capacitor is not really adding something to the capacity, as at least not in air. Now let's add some water here. Four, five, ooh, seven, eight, nine. Can we get 11, 12, 13? Okay, that's also water, a little bit of water seeping in here, but uh, let's go with 14. 
In that thought experiment, we went up from dry 30 picofarads to wet 140 picofarads. And that's a really great increase of 367%. So a really good signal. Um, but there's more. There's really no rule stating that our <laughs> capacitor plates or uh, capacitor electrodes have to be inside the tank. We could also just attach them to the outside of the tank. So let's try that. Well, <clears throat> not nice, but I think it will work. Our initial capacity reading is again 30 picofarad. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is uh, the geometry here. That's a really shitty plate capacitor. It, it, it's formally, it's not even a plate capacitor. But anyway, let's fill some water in here and see if we can detect the change. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A very small change, but a change nonetheless. Can I get five? Can I get five? Can I get five? Please, please. No. Okay. So this gives us really only a very small signal. And there is another drawback. If I just put my hand behind here. Uh, not touching, not touching. But you saw it, yeah. <clears throat> that influences, of course, my hand is also a dielectric material, if it's not too sweaty and I'm touching. Uh, but it influences the capacity a little bit. Um, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> draw that and uh, make a drawing of that and uh, see what's happening here. But before that, the numbers. So we started with 30 picofarads and yeah, our full tank gave us 40 picofarads. So that's, uh, yeah, within <laughs> the resolution, uh, yeah, plus minus one digit of my multimeter. And we had an increase of just 33%. So that's the smallest signal so far. One remark, there are specialized chips for uh, especially that sensor configuration outside the tank to drive your, <clears throat> yeah, your plates, your sensor, and to measure the capacity. They also take into account what I showed you uh, with my hand, that some outside disturbances can influence the capacity and therefore falsify your measurements. Here's a very crude picture of our experiment. We have our uh, two plates here, and then we have our <clears throat> tank made out of polypropylene that has an epsilon r of 2.1. But you see the field lines are passing only uh, for a small, <laughs> very small length through that uh, polypropylene. So you can basically ignore the epsilon r of your container. What you also see a lot of the field lines will be outside the container in air or something else. We saw I can disturb the capacity when I put my hand in here. And also some very long field lines go or reach inside the container where we have either air or water, so we can change the capacity. All in all, as I mentioned, uh, this kind of sensor arrangement is a realm for specialized chips that have specialized driving mechanisms for our two capacitor plates. And one trick they also <clears throat> employ is to have an actively driven shield behind these two plates. But uh, yeah, that's for another video. Maybe I buy such a chip just to, you know, try it out. 
the shield of course is there to uh, avoid the field lines uh, reaching out here and uh, being able to be disturbed by something else like a hand. So far the tank we were using <laughs> was an electrical isolator uh, or made from a dielectric material itself. But what <laughs> if your tank is made out of metal? There's a solution for that too. We just stuff an um, yeah, uh, isolated plate or electrode in, uh, well, it's not an electrode if it's isolated, so an isolated plate into the middle of our tank. Okay, let's measure that. Our initial capacity is 50 nanofarad. Uh, that's larger, okay, than our uh, two outside plates. Uh, just make a note of that because the geometry here is actually not so bad for a capacitor. But now let's add some water. I probably won't fill it up uh, completely, but uh, we will see if that's working. Oh, and it's working nicely. So, 20 uh, 200 picofarads at the end. In our last experiment, we went from initially dry 50 picofarads to wet 200 picofarads. And I didn't even fill up uh, my little can here completely. Uh, that's an increase of 300%. And that's uh, in the order of magnitude uh, or even quite close to the increase that is the actual signal we got with our optimized inside sensor with two plates uh, separated by something not letting water between the plates. So yeah, you can uh, also do a capacitive uh, liquid level measurement in uh, conductive containers. That's it for today. I hope our little <clears throat> theory sessions about yeah at least a uh, uh, qualitative understanding of uh, yeah what makes up capacity or capacitance and our little experiments here gave you a little insight on how to design a sensor that is a capacitor for capacitive liquid level measurement. In the next video in the series, we will actually try to measure our capacity here. I mean, that's uh, in general capacity measurement, uh, not with a multimeter, but maybe with a, I don't know, microcontroller like an Arduino Nano Every. We'll see. Till then, bye.